So this video is, I was planning on actually doing a, another prairie chicken uh, video photography video that I kind of quickly realized, yes, I've done this before. So I wanted to give, you know, six to a dozen of the things you need to look for when out in there doing any kind of upland bird photography, any kind of uh, mating rituals, things you need to kind of be prepared for. Because time and time again, unexpected things happen. And I started reflecting this last trip um, started reflecting on some of the issues that just keep popping up. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is probably going to be more beneficial than just watching a video of someone doing it is bringing up kind of the top 10 reasons or things you need to look out for. So let's get into that. Number one, the biggest one is weather and a backup plan. In all instances of, of doing upland bird photography, there's the environment, wind, rain, snow, and all that kind of stuff. But early in the spring, when most of the birds do their, their wildlife, their, their, their mating ritual, wind is a huge factor in the spring. And so you want a backup plan. Uh, go ahead and check out this video real quick. Well, welcome to windy Nebraska, man. Gonna do some prairie chickens for tonight, tomorrow morning. Hopefully, about a 24 hour stretch, I can get something on the camera. It is extremely, let me back this up as far as I go, um, extremely windy, probably 25 to 45 mile an hour winds. And there's just no way I could use my traditional um, pop up line in this. I, I'd stake it down, I think it'd still get ripped out at the core, or ripped apart. So, we have a solid line, knock on wood. This is nice, but I'm much further away from the action that I'd normally like to be. As I mentioned, I got there looking at a weather app. There was probably, I think, 18 mile an hour winds is what the, the weather forecasted. And there was no way. There was no way that that was, you know, 18 mile an hour winds. Those are more like 30. And so you need a backup plan. You need something that worst case conditions, if it says it's going to rain a little or sprinkle, expect a downpour. If, uh, you know, clouds or sun, expect the opposite. In this instance, we had a huge amount of wind that was just wreaking havoc pretty much all over the, the photography. And I had, uh, my backup plan was this hardwooded uh, blind. And, and it removed me further away from the animals. But at the same time, it allowed me at least a little bit of comfort because, you know, in 30 mile an hour winds, there's no way you're going to put up a tent because <laughs> it's like a parachute out there in, the, in, in an open field like that. You're just going to be blown all over the place and it's probably going to shred your tent at some point or you're going to be, the tent's going to go over and over and you'll be chasing it through a quarter of a mile down the way. So just expect, check your weather apps, have a plan, a backup plan. Even if it's just, you know, shooting photography out of your car, at least you have something to go on um, to make the trip worthwhile. Number two, set expectations to the environment and the weather conditions. So in this instance, I had an 800 mil F 5.6 lens, non-stabilized with a body Canon 90D, non-stabilized as well. So a lot of shaking that could go on. Now I had it on a very big tripod, but this is still roughly about 1260 millimeters of zoom. Works normally, big setup but in my instance i was kind of sticking out of the blind my lens so it was shaking and if you look at some of this video footage the wind is creating havoc all over the place moving it around and doing video but set the expectations i just switched to doing photography and at that point i was using that one over shutter rule about one twelve hundredth of a second and i could get um, somewhat sharp images and you know just take what you can get if you're gonna have extreme colds, take a lot of batteries with you. Maybe not a lot of video because that does eat through the batteries. If it's gonna rain and your gear's not waterproof, 
bring some bags, just set the expectations. It's going to be wet. It's going to be sloppy. You're not going to be as efficient and, and work from there. Number three, show up early, way early. So in a lot of the migrating birds, upland birds, um, the mating rituals, you have to sh you show up really early. Sandhill crane, um, prairie chickens, you have to get into the blind very early. And this requires you to set things up in complete darkness. The thing is, time and time again on these trips, I always burn through way more time than what you'd normally think. For instance, my first trip out to this location, I thought, you know, hour before I can get set up. By the time I navigated through it, it was way too late. I was, it was, the sun was up and it just wasn't possible. So the second time I got out there, I, oh, I'll be an hour early. So I ended up getting out there about five setting up and I barely got the tent set up in time and the birds finally came in. That was like at six something. This last time, just recently, I got up at 4.45, only had a 15 minute trip, but here's the situation. You will burn through a lot of time by navigating in the dark. Even if you have a flashlight, the roads you go down to the location do not look the same. You're looking through your headlamps, you're looking around for markers, because a lot of these places are remote. There are different, different um, signs, different things, different locations. And when you're walking, through the field, you're looking for place marks. Everything looks completely different, so you're walking slower. So even if you've timed your walk during the day, at night, add 25 to 50% more time. And in this last instance the other day, I thought I was gonna be sitting there maybe for a half hour, hour in the dark, not having any action. By the time I actually got done walking through, setting it up, setting up the things for the, I had maybe 15 minutes. 15 minutes before the birds came in where I thought I was going to have an hour. So it does go early, go way early, and you won't be disappointed because once you get in there, you can't go in and spook them. Or they're gone. Um, you pretty much have to be set up in the middle of the night. Number four, in the dark, being able to, to set up gear blind. So in this last video, um, yeah, it, it, was an, it was an issue. End up getting everything set up and the animals came in early. And, and I pretty much clicked on a light because it was so dark, my 90D would not focus and I couldn't see through the EVF. I wanted to go mirrorless. I had an S Sigma FP that I was gonna use. And I clicked on a light just to get the gear. And immediately a couple birds flew off when they seen the light come on. I immediately turned it off because there's a bunch of them. And so I had to rummage through my backpack, my camera back, and grab batteries, grab on the equipment and, and mount it on the lens, on the tripod. That being said, that you have to know your equipment, know where the notches are, know where your batteries are. So in your camera bag, you're gonna need to know where your, where your batteries are at, where your camera gears are at, just fiddling around in the dark where everything kind of feels the same, you know where everything's set, sitting at. Because the closer you get to that daylight hour, the closer to sunrise, the more the animals will move in and you're fumbling around, switching on lights, scaring all kinds of stuff. And you just wanna make sure you're efficient somewhat in the dark or near dark to be able to get in and out, get your gear set up without having to make a lot of commotion with lighting and that. Okay, number five, actually photographing the animals. Know your camera angles, know your sunrise, sunset, setup locations. This is one of the things that a lot of people kind of miss. They, they don't really realize, you know, sun comes up in the east, sets in the west, but what kind of photographs are you gonna take? You're gonna take front lit photos of that, portraits. Um, what kind of angle, where's your angle out of the camera? What kind of angle up or down? Are you gonna take back lit, uh, back lit photos? You know, sun in the back or the side, some rim lighting shots, that kind of situation. Knowing where you're gonna set up is dependent, for me anyway, it's dependent on the type of day. If it's, I'm gonna set up in two or three different locations, depending on that, because I generally like front light. So I'll set up in one location for morning, one location at, at dusk, um, and that. And yeah, it, it kind of works out better, but you're gonna need multiple locations to, to kind of fit the bill if you're looking for a certain shot. Number six. This is the one, always have as much zoom as possible. I can't tell you how many times 
my first my first visit out to this prairie chicken area um, I had an 800 900 millimeter zoom lens and it wasn't enough it just wasn't enough zoom and came back a second day along with a the Nikon 3000 3000 millimeter Nikon P1000 and that saved the day so about 80 percent of my photographs the first trip and it was essentially from the, a point and shoot. I had some other gear, but it was only about eight or 900 millimeters. 3,000 millimeters gives you a lot. And this is not just the first time I've heard this. I had an acquaintance that um, they were in doing sand hill crane photography. And if you've ever done that, pretty much you have to go in when it's dark and leave in the middle of the day. So it's an overnight. Once you go in the, the blind, you can't get out. Well, they forgot their their nikon p1000 and that and the longest i guess the longest lens they had was about 900 millimeters as well and i get a I get a message from a buddy that says yeah we we forgot it oh it's horrible you know they they, they can only get far away shots so always bring in, in wildlife photography if you can your largest lens even if it's back in the car you might need it but just just count on you not being able to get close enough Number seven, know your space limitations. This is one of the things on my second video last year that I set up right around dark and the prairie chickens did not come in. I thought it was because it was too cold out. Then I later found out looking at this, I was just too close. My tent was too close to their area and they were on the lookout. In, one of the, in that video, I show a couple of the prairie chickens peeking their head up, looking at me off in the distance, and it's because I was sitting almost right on top of their area. If I would have been 20 or 30 yards back, no doubt they would have came in and done their, their, their trick. But knowing what the tolerance level to the animals in the area you're gonna set up will pay great dividends because this current year, I backed up just a little bit more and I was able to get them to come in and they showed up at night and in the morning, no problem. So knowing that limitation, it's better to go the first time and not get right up on them, back off, use a little bit bigger lens if you can and do that because more, up, more, more than not, you're gonna kind of ruin that by just getting right up on them and their tolerance will not, will not be there. For prairie chickens in my area, it's about 20, 30 yards. Any closer, they'll bail. They just won't come around the tent and they won't come around um, any, any people in that area within that distance. Number eight, know the rituals of the animal, study the animal before you go. I thought that I understood prairie chickens and, and could, oh, okay, this is no problem. I watched their mating dance. I watched all this kind of stuff. No problem. This is, this is an easy one. The issue is knowing the rituals and then correlating that to your photography. That's the part I didn't understand. And through this second, third year of doing this, I started noticing when I would see two birds just screaming across, that was gonna be a big fight. That's when they're gonna duke it out. And then you notice two birds that are just kind of laying down, looking at each other, not much action's actually gonna go on. So studying this, doing your, your work or your research up front, you'll kind of know when to take photographs and when just to, to ignore it. And that's the situation that I learned over a few periods of time that now I have a different respect for actually doing more research through the internet and that, see how these animals react. Then I can kind of think like, that's when I want to take the photo or that's going to be my setup. And that's, we're going to do this. I had a lot of missed opportunities the first year because I was constantly chasing the animals. and I didn't know which one was actually going to get into a fight and which ones were just going to sit there. Yeah. Knowing the animal, knowing the rituals, the mating, all that jazz will pay di big dividends. Photographing, giving your animal space. So the tough situation that we get in is wanting to zoom in and get that portrait shot. And we kind of forget that, that environmental shot, you know, backing out. But it's also really important when you show, want to show animal behavior because they need, the frame needs them to breathe. It needs to, to show them move around. So if they're, they're doing a little mating dance, if they're pecking at each other, fighting. I noticed my biggest drawback is I would get really close I wanted them to see that and they would fight and peck, but they'd go out of the frame. They'd go off the left, off to the right, and I'd miss that action. So I think that's a big issue with a lot of people's photographs. They want to get that nice 
portrait, eye detail, feather detail. They want to get really close, but then they forget to switch it up. My biggest issue, check out your photographs, see if that's maybe an issue as well. Well, this is a little bit different format, obviously, from, from the previous videos of wildlife. I want to know what you guys think. If, if, happen, if you think it's helpful doing this kind of post-mortem, post-wrap-up kind of situation of what are the things to look for? Where do you fail at? Because really, it kind of comes back to what you learn from the previous outing. What can you do better than you did prior to, to, I guess, put the odds in your favor? Because you're really kind of going into the dark when you're photographing something the first time. You don't know the location. You don't know their habitat as well. You don't know their space, what you can get away with in that. And hopefully this video has helped out some. But anyway, guys, uh, comments, questions, concerns, and hopefully I will see you next week.